So as you know, this last session is on suffering. And it's my prayerful desire to equip all of us to really be able to rise up in our suffering, no matter the cause. I understand that suffering is a very sensitive topic because in order to suffer, we've been hurting. And when we're hurting, we are easily hurt even more. I know that in order for you to, to listen to me, you're probably gonna wanna know a little bit of my own suffering. And it's been interesting to me over the years that there's times when I, I share tidbits of my suffering with people and I often get a blank look and I don't know exactly what they're thinking, but what that communicates to me, whether I'm right or wrong, is that they don't really believe that I have suffered. And maybe they look at my life and they see that I'm married to a strong man of God. They see my children and each of my five children are walking with the Lord. And four of the five are married or almost married and, and they're doing well. My family is doing well. And they must assume that my life has just always been good, that I've just always been blessed and we're here because God has just always shown us his favor and we didn't need to suffer in order to get here. And so because of that, uh, not to defend myself and certainly not to make this session about me, I did find that maybe it would be helpful to share some of the ways that I have suffered so that you can, can know that I'm not just teaching with my head, but I've had to work it out in my own life. And as I share some of these things, I certainly don't want this to become a comparison where any one of us are tempted to think, well, she hasn't suffered as much as I have, or wow, she's suffered a lot more than I would think a pastor's wife has ever suffered, or yeah, but she still doesn't understand me. It's not about comparison, it's about the reality of life. And the reality is that I know that we have all suffered and it's very uniquely that we suffer. And so as I was writing this message, I, I didn't have a hard time coming up with at least 17 ways that I have suffered. The first thing that usually comes to mind is the fact that I grew up in a family slash culture of shame and privacy, which led to a lot of fear and anxiety and guilt. And then growing up in this same culture uh, led to deep feelings of inferiority, probably because of the shame and the privacy that led to fear and anxiety and guilt. Thirdly, growing up in a home where conflict was rarely discussed or properly resolved, uh, which left a lot of tension. I don't want to paint my parents in a negative light. I think they did the best that they could with the information and the skills that they had. I know they very much loved me and I very much love them, but they were limited in their resources. And then of course, growing up this way, learning patterns, I know I brought some of these things into my own home. And then there's shame for my own sin. And then there was postpartum and then there was severe anemia that I suffered from for quite some time from severe menstrual issues that left me with some very embarrassing moments, left me feeling very exhausted where I literally would be at work as working in a nursing home and I literally thought, okay, just one step forward, I just have to keep going. Not realizing it was because of my anemia, I thought I was just a tired mom with lots of young children. Um, after my fifth child, I had a uh, in the amniotic fluid embolism, which almost took my life. And then of course, recovering from almost dying. Uh, also having spiritual attack in our home. I'm married to a pastor and I'm, I myself am in ministry. It's kind of like a double whammy. Satan loves to come after us. And then there was financial stress when our children were younger, wondering how can I provide sufficiently for them with our limited income. And then there was uh, I'll pass on that for now. Um, during COVID, having a husband, family, and church that were attacked, 
as we resisted government tyranny. Also feeling very alone during COVID, and of course, the aloneness was heightened by what my family was going through. And then also feeling very alone because my husband was very busy taking care of the church and the community and speaking into cultural issues that I felt very alone. Uh, I felt a lot of abandonment and rejected by people who I thought were friends and not just because of COVID. And then uh, there was my brother-in-law who lived with us for about six weeks. He left our home and immediately went and rented a hotel and took his own life. And then there was another family member that also tried to take her own life. And finding that out was probably one of the darkest times in my life. It was someone that shouldn't do that. And yet I know in her own life, she herself had endured a lot of suffering. She had lost a child when he was very, very young. She'd had a few miscarriages. She was in a marriage that she would have felt very unloved. And she did not know how to cope with all of her trials. And it brought her to a point where she tried to take her own life. And so all of that to say, my suffering might be different. I don't have this big story, but I have a list of things that have deeply impacted me. And some of those things I might have just gone through and maybe some of it almost seemed mechanical, but it's because largely I've processed those things and I know that those things no longer de define me. And I kind of relate to what Desiree said. It's, it's almost as if that was a different life. That's not who I am anymore. All those things have helped shape me and particularly the last one, seeing a family member try to take her own life showed me that if we don't deal with suffering, if we don't equip ourselves to, suffer, to know how to suffer and to suffer well for Jesus, each one of us could be on that same path. And so it's super important that we all learn how to suffer well. I'm not going to ask any one of you if you have suffered, because I know that you have. But I wanna ask you, how have you responded to suffering? Have you become stuck in your suffering? Have you become numb? Have you started feeling like a victim, like that's who you will always be? Or have you been freed because of your suffering, freed to find mercy and grace in the presence of Jesus? And so I just want to say that there are various reasons why we suffer, but because of the gospel, we are called to rise up for Jesus in our suffering, no matter the cause. James 1, 2 to 4 says this, there are various reasons why we suffer, but because of the gospel, we are called to rise up for Jesus. Sorry, that was, that was not the verse I was trying to read. That was the quote I just said. The verse, James 1, 2 to 4, says this, <clears throat> Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so I want to talk about four different types of suffering that I originally saw categorized in a uh, biblical counseling document called Rings of Suffering. And I think for me, it's helpful to kind of understand the four different types. It's not a comparison as if one is more significant than the other or one is worse than the other, but rather if we understand the type of suffering, then we can go to God's word and understand how we can best respond biblically to that suffering. And so I just want to stress the fact that it's not for the purpose of comparing our suffering. As we continue, uh, I believe that sometimes Satan likes to feed us lies in our suffering. And some of those lies are things that I've already mentioned, things that oh, well, her suffering isn't as bad as mine. Nobody else understands what I'm going through. I'm the only one that is have, has this happening to, to me. She doesn't really have any words of comfort for me. I'm all alone. 
And I believe that to think this way actually causes us to suffer more. And then Satan wins because he, he actually makes our suffering even worse if we're giving in to those types of lies that make us feel that we are all alone and that nobody truly understands. You see, I don't have to have gone through the exact same thing that you have to be able to understand your suffering. When I'm counseling women, there's times when they come into my office and their story might be different, but the pattern of what they've gone through, I can very much resonate with that. The struggles, the doubts, the questions, the aloneness, I absolutely understand it. And we should be able to understand one another if we truly understand that we are united in Christ and that we're not going through this journey of life alone. We are the body of Christ. We should love and care and invest and sympathize and empathize and care for one another. And so as I talk about these things, I don't want them to be individual, personal stories that we each feel are ours and ours alone. But just understand that we all suffer, and we probably all suffer in a variety of ways. And we want to be equipped to suffer well because James 1.12 also says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And I want all of us to be blessed as we go through suffering, as we remain steadfast, and uh, so let's, let's get equipped. Let's rise up and be willing to defeat the lies of Satan that make us, him, make us feel like we are very much alone and we are worse off than everybody else and realize that we are suffering for Jesus and no matter the cause, we can rise up. And so the first thing I wanna look at, the first cause of suffering is because of our own personal sin. And so, I want you to think about how you have personally suffered because of the guilt that you have caused in your own life. Um, maybe that guilt has made you feel worthless or insecure or isolated or ashamed. Maybe there's consequences that you have to deal with because of your sin. And sometimes these consequences are removed the moment you repent. But sometimes these consequences are actually something that we have to accept for the rest of our lives. There is suffering because of personal sin. But what do we do? What is the biblical response when we are suffering because we have personally sinned? First of all, we have to recognize that it all starts with salvation. And it starts by um, recognizing, as it says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So have you first and foremost come to realize that you, you personally have sinned and offended God and that you are guilty because of that. You are separated for eternity because of your own personal sin. If you have come to that conclusion, and uh, as it says in Acts 2.38, if you have repented and you are baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you have been saved, you have been set free from that guilt and that sin, and Jesus has saved you. But it all starts at salvation. You have to begin the moment that you repent and believe that Jesus died for you, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that there is no way you can get to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And then once you have received that, that then you know that you are justified, and that means that God looks at you just as if you never sinned. You have a clear slate before him. All the um, legal obligations of, of you requiring your own punishment have been lifted because Jesus Christ was punished on your behalf. And so you are set free. But the reality is you're still living in a sinful world and you're still in the process of being sanctified. And that means that although you have been saved and the legal obligation of your punishment has been paid for, you're still in process. That means you're still going to be sinning. And as you sin, 
you need to know that we need to live a lifestyle of repentance. And it kind of goes along with my message from last night, if you were here. We have to be humble enough to actually admit when we have sinned. Sometimes as Christians, we don't like to admit it anymore because we like to pretend that we've got it all together. I know I grew up in a, in a church setting where we never talked about our own personal sin anymore because it was like, okay, you cover that up, right? Because you've got to pretend that you're this perfect person now. Well, we're not. We're still in the process. And Jesus calls us to just repent. And so if you're enduring guilt because you've sinned and you need restoration, he just says, come to me. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us, that's a purification word. And so no matter what you've done, even as a Christian, if you repent, he will clean you up. And so you no longer have to live with that guilt. You might certainly have some consequences, right? Like if you lived a destructive lifestyle, maybe su substance abuse, it doesn't mean you're gonna be healed from the effects of that substance abuse, but you're forgiven. If you had a, a marital affair, it's, there's no guarantee that your husband's going to take you back. But in the, the eyes of Jesus, if you've repented, you're restored. And so no matter the sin, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you repent, you can be set free. You don't have to live with that guilt and shame for the rest of your life. And so it's so important that we understand that, that we confess our sins don't try to hide it. Don't try to cover it up and, and just hold on to it, hiding and pretending as if nothing happened. Confess, and Jesus wants to set you free. And then once we've been set free, once we've repented and be re been restored, then we rise up in worship. Psalm 51 verse 14 uh, has a beautiful verse that says, deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. You see, the result of being restored after committing some of the most heinous sins, Psalm 51 is talking about David, King David, who, who had an affair, who got another man's wife pregnant and had that man killed. This is his words. These are his words. He committed some of the most horrible acts of sin, and yet when he repented, he was immediately restored and forgiven, and he was able to sing aloud of the righteousness of God. And so when we've been forgiven, we rise up in worship. And then thirdly, we rise up together. We are a community of faith. We should not try to live this life alone, pretending that we've got it all together. No, rise up together. Let your sisters in Christ know what you're struggling with, what you've confessed to the Lord, how you need to be held accountable. Allow them to point you to Jesus, to, to give you words of encouragement, to read scripture to you, to help you to grow in Christ's likeness. You don't have to live this life alone. Isolating yourself is never the answer. And being an introvert is not an excuse. We are designed for community. And living in community will help us to rise up when we face the consequences of personal sin. And the reality is, uh, before we can even look to other types of suffering, we need to deal with the sin in our own lives. Luke 6, 42 says, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your eye? You hypocrite, first take out the log that is in your eye and then you will be able to see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. And so once we've dealt with our own sin, that's when we can start saying, okay, sometimes we suffer because of other people's sin against us. And often, other people's sin causes us to feel shame. So I'm wondering if any of you have ever felt the shame of another person's sin. Maybe it's been repeated words of ridicule. Someone that ridicules you. Maybe it's an older sibling. Maybe it's a bully at school. Maybe it's a parent that ridicules you, that criticizes you, and makes you feel ashamed of who you are. Or maybe it's abuse, sexual abuse, 
physical abuse, any kind of abuse that makes you feel like you're the one that is shamed. Refuse to carry another person's shame. It's not yours. It's not meant for you to carry. It's not your shame. Psalm 25, two to three says, Oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. And so if you are not the one that has sinned, you are not the one who should feel shame. It's not your shame. It's their shame. Give it back to them. And giving it back to them does not mean that you build up a wall of self-protection, that you turn bitter. No, rather we rise up in trusting God to be the righteous judge. You see, we don't have the capacity to be righteous judges, but God does. You see, in the end, if that person repents, they will receive the same mercy and grace as we have. And they don't deserve it any more than we do. But if they repent, no matter what they have done to you, God in his righteousness will grant them forgiveness. But at the same time, if they never repent and come to know Jesus as their savior, they will end up with eternal damnation and separation from God. And that's God's righteous judgment that will pass that on to them. But we also need to be ready and willing and eager to grant forgiveness to those who are repentant. And so when people come to you in repentance, be quick to forgive them, no matter how much they've hurt you. Our role as Christians is to be in the ministry of reconciliation. We wanna reconcile our relationships. We wanna be quick to forgive those who have sinned against us. And even if they never repent, we want to guard our own hearts by putting off bitterness and vengeance towards them. You see, we can't force anyone to repent or to acknowledge their sin, but we entrust that to a righteous God to ultimately, in the end, pronounce judgment as he sees fit, and we know that he will do that perfectly. And so we don't have to take it into our own hands. We don't have to bottle it up. We don't have to uh, continue to, to exude all this contempt and hatred towards them. No, let God take care of that. Their shame is on them. And if they repent, their shame will be lifted. And if they don't, they will have an account to give to Jesus Christ. So trust God to be the righteous judge. Let go of all bitterness and vengeance towards them. And then once again, we rise up together, right? We are not alone in this suffering. So once again, if we are able to, we want to reconcile with the person who has offended us. But even if they aren't willing to reconcile, let's not bottle up all these emotions and all this shame, carrying it on our own. Let's share with our brothers and sisters. Let's invite mature Christian mentors into our life. We never want to become gossips or slanderers, even against those who have hurt us or offended us. But if you need help in overcoming this, let's not be so silent that we aren't willing to, to ask a mature Christian counselor or mentor or a small group leader to help you in that process. And we don't just tell anybody the sins of other people, but if they're part of the restoration process, let's invite them in instead of thinking that we can do it all on our own. Just like yesterday, we were talking about being so self-sufficient, thinking we can do everything on our own. Let's rise up together in our suffering. Uh, the third way we suffer is because of spiritual attack. And many of you have probably felt that. It's a very dark, fear, maybe a feeling of dread and overwhelm that comes at you out of, a, out of nowhere. And sometimes it happens because you're a new Christian, you've just been baptized, and Satan sees this girl's on a different track, 
and he wants to stop you. He wants to destroy what Jesus Christ is doing in your life, and so he, he'll try to attack you. Or maybe it's um, as you're about to endeavor in a new ministry or um, an evangelistic project or you're speaking up for cultural issues. Satan loves to attack during those times. He likes to stop you because he does not want you to be prosperous. He does not want you to be fruitful. He does not want you to move forward in your Christian faith. And so we need to be prepared for that. It's very dark. It's very difficult. But once again, the Bible has the answer for our suffering when we are under spiritual attack. So we rise up in spiritual battle. Battle. First Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. One thing I learned very quickly is not to live in fear. We need to be aware that Satan loves to prowl around. Probably right now he's looking for someone to destroy and to devour. So as you leave this conference this afternoon, some of you are going to be attacked. And it might come from uh, God working in your life, revealing some truth to you during this conference. And then when you go home, you start second guessing it or thinking, oh yeah, uh, maybe I was deceived. Maybe God didn't really say that to me. I'm not going to do anything about that just yet. Or maybe it's going home and facing chaos. Maybe it's with young children or maybe it's bad news or whatever it might be. Um, some of us might face spiritual attack after this because Satan doesn't want anything that happened this weekend to be fruitful and effective. So we want to be on guard for that. But we don't have to be afraid because we know that God is stronger, that Jesus is, has already won the victory for us, and that the power of the cross is way stronger than Satan could ever be. So what do we do? As this verse says, we, we are sober-minded. Let's keep our minds clear. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by not getting into substances that muffle up our mind, by not being so anxious that we can't think clearly. If we're anxious, we cast all our cares on the Lord. Be sober-minded, be watchful, be aware, be alert. See when it's happening so you don't fall for it. And, and then resist him. Uh, firm in your faith. And then once again, just realize you are not alone. Right? It says, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You're not alone. You're not the only one that's ever been spiritually attacked. You are have the ability to overcome this. So as soon as you feel it, you, you pray, you resist, you, you speak the word of God, you, you flee, you run from whatever it is. You don't dwell on those thoughts or in those feelings. You don't isolate yourself. You share with other people, invite them to pray for you. One of the things that we do as, as leaders when we're planning a conference, I, I ask my speakers, I'm like, get your small group praying for you. Get people praying for you. Get my leadership team, get people praying for you because I know Satan's going to want to attack. So let's not try to do this on our own. Invite people in. And you have your own story. Some of you are uh, in jobs where you are facing the enemy on a daily basis. And it can be very overwhelming, very hard. And some of those places might be very dark places because Satan is roaming around, prowling around, trying to devour. Get people praying for you. Be in the Word before you go to work. Be praying before you go to work. Speak gospel truth to yourself, to your coworkers, whatever the situation might be. But resist him. Be firm in your faith. And along with that, we put on the full armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 to 22, common passage of scripture, but let's read it because it, it gives us strength. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So it's not our own strength. If we're trying to fight spiritual battles in our own strength, we are going to fall flat in our face and we're going to go down to the pit. But we do it with his might. We put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. See, stand. We're upright. We're not 
flat on our face, fallen down. We are standing against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Are we convinced yet? There are evil forces all around us trying to devour us. And so we have to take up the armor. It says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That should give us confidence, not fear. So first of all, we've just been exposed to the fact that there's spiritual forces, evil forces all around us, but we don't live in fear. No, we, we take up the whole armor. We, we, are able to, we are able to withstand in the evil day and having all to stand firm. So stand upright, you stand solid, you place your feet on the ground and you say, Satan's not gonna get me. I'm not gonna give in. We stand therefore having fastened the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as your shoes for your feet, put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which, once again, listen to this, li listen to this. Okay, I love this and I remember going through some dark days myself and, and this would give me strength and power and hope, it says, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So you're just picturing all the flaming darts. He's trying to get you from all different directions and angles, but we've got the shield of faith protecting us, right? We don't live in fear, but we're on guard. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end once again keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints and also for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which i am an ambassador in chains that i may declare it boldly as i ought to speak once again rise up together. We are not alone in this spiritual battle. And if Satan is trying to make you feel alone, no matter what the excuse is, he's gonna be very creative and he knows you very, very individually. He knows what your weaknesses are and he's gonna try and make you feel very, very alone as you're fighting this battle. So whatever lie he's trying to feed you, even right now, you deny it. You, you do not believe it because as it says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me. We need to do this together. We need to fight this spiritual battle together as sisters in Christ. We are not gonna be victorious if we try to do this alone. And with that, I just also want to read Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, because it's another prayer that I have often prayed uh, for my own life. I've prayed it for other people and it's just, it's, it's a transformative prayer if you begin to understand it. And it was actually amazing. We just did this um, prayer in our women's Bible study. And although I've read it many times, the Lord opened my eyes to something new here. And the newness was that it wasn't just an individual personal prayer, but that was a, once again a prayer that we are in this battle together. Uh, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21 says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, listen to this, may have strength to comprehend with all all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever amen and I know that there's some women here that feel very much alone. Maybe you've never been married. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you're going through 
an extreme marital conflict. Maybe you've been neglected by your parents or maybe you've been rejected by your friends or maybe you've been laid off from work and you feel very alone. You are not alone. We are saints together, rising up, fighting this battle, being empowered by the Spirit of God. He's not just working in us individually, but he's working in us together. So let's rise up together as we fight this spiritual battle. And we're on to number four. And number four is that we sometimes suffer because we live in a world that is damaged by sin. And this is such a huge topic. I, I had a bit of a difficult time narrowing it down. But what I wanted to do is put it into two categories. And I could probably divide it into more categories, but I wanted to divide it into the physical. You see, everything, the physical and the, the mind. So the physical is everything has been affected by sin, right? Uh, I'm not talking about the kind of uh, effects that are due to personal sin, but the kind of effects that are just the result of living in a world that is affected by sin. Romans 8, 20 to 22 says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So we live in a world, all of creation has been impacted by sin. And so as women, one of my first things comes to mind is that pretty much all of our womanhood, as beautiful as it is, has been impacted by the curse of sin. Think about monthly menstruation and the cramps that we endure, the pain in pregnancy, the, the pain in delivering a baby, the pain in postpartum, in, in raising our children, in some women who, who suffer from miscarriage or from infertility, the, the pain that we endure in learning to submit to our husbands in marriage, all of our womanhood has been affected because of sin. And it's not necessarily because of our own personal sin, it's there. And on top of that, we have been in fact, or impacted because there is sickness in the, this world, there is disease in this world, there is death in this world, and it's not all because of personal sin, it's because of the sin that has impacted our creation. And then secondly, sinful minds, our minds have been impacted. And I could go into a whole list of how our, our minds as women have been impacted, but I'm not gonna do that today because I wanna focus more on the way that the minds of the world have been impacted. Paul calls it a debased mind. And in Romans 1.28 it says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And so we see this more than ever in our world that the whole system has been corrupted by evil. And here we are trying to fight against it. We, we live in a world that is aggressively opposed to Jesus and all of his truth. And if we are Christians, we will suffer because of that, because we cannot stay silent. We cannot fit in to the context of this world if we are Christians, because the world is so opposed. And that means that if we speak up, they will oppose us and they will hate us and we will be rejected and we will suffer from persecution. But we need to remember that John, as it says in John 15, 18, uh, these are Jesus' words. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me first before it hated you. And 1 Peter 4, 14 says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the glory or spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Uh, the book of 1 Peter talks a lot about suffering. If you want to read more on that, it's a short book, but it talks about suffering 18 times. It uses that word. I looked it up. Uh, so you can learn a lot. Just do a study in the book of 1 Peter and that means that as Christians, we have to be prepared for suffering. We, 
we shouldn't be surprised when it comes. Let's be prepared so that we can rise up for Jesus in our suffering. We don't have to try and avoid it, it's coming. And we need to know how to respond. So the first thing we do when we're responding to the suffering that we endure because of living in a sin-affected world is we rise up in truth. And that means we believe it and we live it. So how do we believe it? We have to know that his grace is sufficient. Second Corinthians 12, nine to 10 says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Is that our testimony? Are we actually content with insults and hardships? And we need to, so we need to know that his grace is sufficient. We need to know that his presence is strength. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, fear not. So what is it that you're going through? Jesus says, fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so we need to acknowledge that he does not promise to remove suffering from us, but he promises to be with us. He promises that he is our God. That he promises that he will strengthen us, that he will lift us up, that he will uphold us with his righteous right hand. And so if we have his presence, he gives us the strength to endure whatever calamity or suffering he brings us through. And then number three, we need to know that he is sovereign. He is in absolute control of everything that happens. And I find it kind of interesting that many of us have talked about Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot. She is a woman who did rise up in her suffering. And even though she's a woman that wrote, suffered incredibly like i can't even imagine what she all went through she is quick to say she knows very little about suffering very humble woman but this is her story um, about understanding that god is sovereign she says um, the aka story has pointed to one thing god is god if he is god he is worthy of my worship and my service i will find rest nowhere but in his will and that will is infinitely, immeasurably, unspeakably beyond my largest notion of what he is up to. God is the God of human history, and he is at work continuously, mysteriously, accomplishing his eternal purposes in us, through us, for us, and in spite of us. Cause and effect are in God's hands. Is it not the part of faith simply to let them rest there? God is God. I dethrone him, dethrone him in my heart if I demand that he act in ways that satisfy my idea of justice. The only one who laid the earth's foundations and settled its dimensions knows where the lines are drawn. So she is a woman who has suffered incredibly, but she recognizes that he is God, that he's going to accomplish his purposes. We can't stop it. We're not anywhere near in a, being in a position where we can say that he is unjust. If he is allowing suffering in our lives, we know that he has a purpose and a plan, and he desires us to worship him through it all. So those are things we need to know and believe. We need to believe that his grace is sufficient, that his presence is strength, and that he is sovereign. And then we need to go and live it. Because if we don't actually go and live it, it means we don't actually believe it. So we go and live it. And how do we live it? We don't compromise his truth. We inform ourselves of truth, and preferably before we begin suffering, so that when we suffer, we are equipped to be able to make righteous decisions rather than emotional ones. And so as women, let's be prepared. Let's educate ourselves in God's word, not in everything else, science, psychology, the world's system, but in God's word about the tough things in life that we as women endure. We need to be prepared to make righteous decisions rather than emotional decisions when it comes to sickness that could impact any one of us or our family or our loved ones, death, infertility, financial loss, 
rejection, wayward children, unplanned pregnancies, persecution. We need to be ready to face any one of those because we don't know what comes next. We don't know what's in store for us. We need to be ready to make righteous decisions. Because if in the moment you are faced with one of these traumatic experiences and we haven't equipped ourselves in the truth, we are much more likely to make a compromised decision and to do what feels best in the moment rather than doing what's right. You see, I was in the... Um, gospel conversations about abortion breakout session and one of the questions I asked our speaker was what is the main reason that women have abortions is it shame is it not being able to provide what is it and you know what the answer was inconvenience right when a, a young woman or maybe even an older woman finds out that she's pregnant and in the moment, it doesn't seem like the right thing. She's going to want to do whatever it takes to just get rid of it if she hasn't been prepared to do the right thing. And if she's your friend coming to you and you're not equipped and ready to share the truth with her, she's going to be able to manipulate your emotions so that you soften the truth and in the end, you walk away without having told her that abortion is murder and that she's taking the life of her own child, and that she's dehumanizing herself in the process and she's gonna regret it for the rest of her life. We have to be prepared to make right decisions rather than emotional ones. We also have to be prepared to preach the gospel. That means that we preach Christ alone and we never water it down. You will always regret it. I've certainly been in situations where I haven't given the full gospel. And it's a horrible feeling when you walk away and you realize I should have said more. Don't water the gospel. Be prepared. And if you need to listen to Don McKenna's message one more time, get prepared to give your gospel glory story so that you can always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. And we need to be willing to teach into the cultural issues. I already stepped on to the uh, abortion issue, but there's other issues that we need to educate our minds on so that we are ready to give a righteous answer rather than an emotional one. We have to be ready for the gender issue. We have to be ready to, to speak into um, critical race theory. We have to be ready to speak into medical ethics. We have to be ready to speak into womanhood, into love. We have to be ready to, to know how to face when people say, well, love is love. No, love is not love. God is love, and God has standards for what love is. And uh, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to speak into MAID, which is becoming more and more common in our culture. And if we're not equipped, any one of us can be sucked into that compassionate conversation, right? Well, isn't it more compassionate to, to just let this loved one die peacefully when she chooses? Because after all, she's suffering isn't it more compassionate to let her choose to die now? No, God is the author and giver of life. It is not our choice. We have to be ready to speak into these cultural issues. And fourthly, we have to be ready to speak truth into our own minds. And we have to be ready to rise up for suffering. You see, I think... Some of the things that we as women do is we, we can get into our own heads and we can begin thinking that our problems are bigger than life. And all we think about is the suffering that we're enduring. And we begin to think that no one, once again, is able to speak into our suffering. And sometimes we actually shout out God's word or God's people, the very agents that God has given to us to protect us when we're suffering, 
and we shut them out because we're not willing to listen to them because we, we protect ourselves and we think that we know best and that nobody else actually understands our suffering. So once again, let's allow other people to speak into our suffering and never allow ourselves to think that other people don't know what to say to me. God's word doesn't apply to me this time. This is different. That's a lie. God's word always has something to say to whatever it is that you are suffering. And then we rise up in hope as we endure a world that is filled with aggressively angry, hateful people, as we endure the suffering consequences of living in a world that has been affected by, by sin. We rise up knowing that, as it says in Romans 8, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. We rise up in hope because there is eternity in store for us. And then once again, maybe you've seen a theme here, we rise up together. We rise up together in our personal sin. We rise up together when others have sinned against us. We rise up together when we are facing spiritual attack and we rise up together in a corrupt world, a world that has been affected by sin. Uh, so let's determine that we will not do this alone, that we will not stop sharing the gospel. Let's agree together that we will not compromise God's truth in culture because of fear of rejection or fear of loss or fear of whatever it might be. And when we are persecuted, not if we are, but when we are persecuted, let's have the same mind, the same attitude as, as the apostles did in Acts 5.41. Once again, our theme, that whether we are beaten, whether we are arrested, whether we are rejected, whether we are threatened to be killed, we will together rejoice that we have been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So I don't know what lies ahead. I don't know if we will have days of peace or if we will have days of suffering. But in our suffering, let's rise up together. Let's commit together that we're not going to suffer alone. We're not going to allow our sisters to suffer alone. So whether she is suffering from her own sin or the sin of other people or the sin of spiritual attack or, or, or sorry, the suffering of spiritual attack or the suffering of living in a broken world, let's go through this together. Let's rise up together. Let's not shrink back, but rejoice that we have been counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Suffering is not the end of the story. His glory is the end of the story.